Thank you, Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I, I would like to thank uh, PIDS, PIDS, uh, especially to Dr. Beb Sorbeta and to Sheila and to our SERPI uh, network uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to focus my discussion uh, on the fiscal response of government to natural disasters in the context of the Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance or uh, DRFI. Uh, my point in this uh, presentation are based on uh, a policy paper that we prepared on the same subject. Uh, this is available on the CPBRD and SERP website and also from our recent engagement with the World Bank and key house leaders in relation to the proposed amendments to House Bill 5889 uh, or the Disaster, Resi Disaster Resilience Act, last 18th Congress. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Weather-related uh, catastrophic disasters, uh, let me also add uh, health-related public crises have increased in frequency and their economic impact have become more costly over time. And if you're going to look at the slide, uh, about 60% of total land area and close to 74% of total population are exposed to multiple uh, natural hazards. And based on the catastrophe risk modeling, uh, uh, the average annual loss to public and private assets caused by earthquakes and typhoon has been estimated to be uh, about 176.6 billion and of which uh, earthquake accounts for 43.5 billion and tropical cyclone about uh, 133.2 billion. So what does this uh, tell us? Uh, this tells us that the public sector must improve its uh, budget response capacity uh, in the aftermath of a disaster. I think uh, Dr. Atessa uh, mentioned this uh, in the lessons from uh, Yulan that uh, how uh, uh, how uh, important is our uh, fiscal response to natural disasters and to be able to manage uh, volatility on the fiscal side. Uh, that, and just to tell you, of course, how much the cost of uh, the fiscal response to natural disasters, especially uh, when uh, hit by uh, the same magnitude uh, such as uh, Yolanda. So the government's reliance on uh, exposed resources especially on budget allocation uh, and other instruments that do not require advanced planning, uh, puts the management of fiscal resources to increase instability and uncertainty. Uh, but uh, ex-ante disaster risk financing and insurance can facilitate better fiscal management of disaster risk because it anticipates uh, potential budgetary impacts and plans ahead to ensure adequate uh, financial capacity and quick release of funds. Uh, specifically, uh, a National Disaster Trust Fund, uh, which is the subject of this presentation, can be used to secure advanced financing of disaster costs, especially reconstruction uh, operations. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, to develop uh, a effective DRFI strategy, there are certain elements or numbers of consideration that uh, we that need to be taken account. So first is the uh, the time dimension. So as you can see in the slide, uh, different phases of the post disaster intervention, meaning relief, reco recovery, and re reconstruction, entails different uh, time dimension. So, uh, and also, of course, the resource requirement needed to uh, respond to uh, uh, this uh, specific uh, phases. So, the timelines of post disaster uh, phases, uh, well, for example, while immediate resources will be needed to support uh, relief operations the bulk of funds will only be required several months later when the actual reconstruction program starts. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, the time uh, element uh, in terms of the uh, reconstruction accounts for the usually the longest time to, to attend to. And if you look at the resource requirement, it's also the highest among the uh, different phases of post-disaster uh, intervention. So again, we have to consider the time dimensions uh, in terms of uh, post-disaster uh, requirement. Uh, next slide, please. So another uh, element that needs to be considered is the cost of financial instruments. So uh, the cost of financial instrument dif 
differs depending on the one uh, cost of capital. Uh, uh, in this case, the, the cost multiplier is uh, defined as the ratio of the cost of financial product and the expected payout of the financial product. And the second is uh, the rate of disbursement. How long does the uh, release or the uh, processing and release of uh, the funds out of these uh, financial instruments? And third is the amount of funds that each instrument can provide. Uh, okay, for instance, uh, Foreign aid, uh, in this case, donor support, uh, either in relief or recovery, uh, may be cheap capital, but disbursement to the government often takes several months. Uh, another major source of post-disaster funds are the reserves or savings of government. These funds are cheap uh, capital and the disbursement can be quick as these funds are already available. However, the amount of money are usually limited. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the use of risk transfer instruments uh, these are uh, usually uh, uh, instruments that transfer risk to a third party, such as uh, insurance, can provide large amount of funds, but can be relatively costly. Uh, depending on the type of insurance, uh, disbursement rates can be quick in the case of uh, parametric insurance or lengthy uh, in the case of traditional uh, indemnity-based uh, insurance. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, these are sources of disaster financing. So as you can see, uh, the, the slide presents different, uh, is different uh, uh, instruments for uh, ex post and ex ante uh, financing that government can use to mobilize funding uh, after a disaster. Uh, it also provides an assessment of the time necessary to disburse uh, the funds. Uh, more or less the advantage uh, of ex ante instruments is that these are secured before a disaster uh, uh, before a disaster and thus allows for quick disbursement. Uh, of course, uh, quick disbursement character of ex ante instruments like uh, parametric insurance also has a cost. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. And the uh, third element of uh, uh, in, in coming up with an effective uh, DRFI strategy is the risk, risk layering. Uh, so the immediate and long-term fiscal impact of natural, natural disasters depend on the nature and the severity of each event and the disaster risk financing instrument that is available to the government. So an effective uh, DRFI strategy applies a three-tiered uh, risk layered approach to cover for uh, residual risk that cannot be mitigated. So the layered approach moves from a lower, intermediate, and higher risk of higher layers of risk that correspond to various degrees of disaster frequency and uh, severity. So, as you can see from the slide, uh, the the uh, uh, lesser frequency as well as the uh, uh, greater severity of the impact uh, entails high high risk. Uh, high risk disaster. And this also entails uh, certain uh, risk instruments, uh, what they refer to as uh, risk transfers, uh, such as, uh, in this case, the parametric insurance or uh, cut bonds. Uh, but again, uh, uh, this also entails a certain level of cost. So again, uh, looking at this uh, uh, risk layering strategy uh, tells us that uh, government should consider different types or a mix of uh, fiscal instruments that need to be applied to uh, to respond uh, fiscally to natural disasters. So it's important that uh, we try to leverage uh, our uh, risk uh, and spread it uh, to different uh, uh, risk uh, risk transfer or risk uh, risk retention uh, instruments. Okay. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So uh, basically, the uh, in terms of uh, DFRI practice in the Philippines, uh, we are already uh, there are already existing uh, uh, DFRI instruments that cover uh, various risks, uh, and these include the End Dream Fund and the Local Disaster Risk Management Fund. Uh, in this case, as you can see, uh, the risk layer entails uh, uh, is very low. Uh, and uh, you also have uh, contingent uh, credit lines, uh, an example of which is the World Bank that offered a, a, 
uh, a contingent credit line or what do they refer to as the development policy loan uh, with catastrophe deferred drawback option or uh, uh, or basically a cut ban. Uh, so on uh, in November 2019, uh, the World Bank issued uh, two tranches of uh, cut bans with insurance coverage of maximum of 225 U uh, million US dollars uh, for three years. So uh, the process was the Philippines pays for the insurance premium uh, for the coverage, uh, of course, with the cost, which the World Bank transfers to uh, cut bond investors. Uh, and uh, another uh, and last uh, DRFI instruments that uh, is currently being practiced at the moment in the country is the GS GSIS uh, indemnity-based insurance uh, for higher uh, layers of risk. Uh, again, uh, based, on, uh, based on the law, the property, uh, specifically the property insurance law, requires every government unit, uh, except uh, municipal governments below first class, to ensure its uh, properties uh, consistent with the provisions of the property uh, insurance uh, fund. So the national disaster or the Endrim fund uh, or the Endrim uh, law provides, uh, I think uh, Dr. Achesa also, also mentioned this, that uh, provides already much of the legal basis uh, for uh, disaster risk uh, intervention. In this case, uh, disaster risk uh, Finance, financing insurance. So the law has provisions with respect to the calamity funds which are funded through the annual budget appropriations, uh, a share equal to 30% of both the Endrim Fund and the Local Disaster Risk Management Fund are to be allocated to a quick response fund or QR, QRF or a standby fund for relief uh, and recovery programs. And at the local level, the law also allows for any unspent uh, local disaster risk management resource fund uh, to be rolled over at the end of the fiscal year and accrued to a special trust fund up to five years. So for, for, the, for the LDRMF to be used for the purchase of insurance coverage and for local governments to transfer their unexpected uh, funds to other LGUs. So again, uh, if you look at the legal framework, uh, more or less, uh, there is already a legal basis for uh, both national government and local government to uh, uh, to adopt uh, uh, DRFI. However, the critical gap of the law is that it provides a piecemeal and discount, disjointed approach to overall uh, D DRFI management. It does not integrate uh, both uh, risk retention and risk transfer instruments as part of an overall uh, DRFI strategy. So what is needed is an integrated approach that uh, will combine, as I was saying, uh, emphasizing earlier, the use of various uh, uh, risk transfer instruments or risk retention instruments uh, based on uh, the risk profile, uh, the fiscal position of the government, as well as the pre uh, prevailing market conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, again, uh, considering all the policy gaps that I was mentioning, uh, the DOF formulated a national D DRFI strategy in 2015 that is rooted uh, in a risk layering strategy as I was uh, as I showed uh, earlier. So as you can see, the strategy is composed of uh, risk financing instruments that provide financial protection for disasters of uh, different frequencies and uh, severities. Uh, again, in view of the COVID uh, pandemic outbreak, uh, the, this, this strategy can be expanded to cover other shocks uh, and government risk planning to include uh, pandemic risk and not only uh, natural disaster uh, risk. Uh, I just would like to point out a, uh, an item here. Uh, there's a new national indemnity insurance program included in that strategy, uh, which is uh, under still under preparation to improve uh, insurance protection for higher risk national government uh, assets. Later on, uh, I'll be mentioning to you why this particular program is still, why is it still under uh, preparation? So uh, again, if it's possible to explore uh, new financing uh, sources for catastrophe risk insurance programs, uh, given this type of strategy to respond to pandemic risks, as well as other uh, natural hazards. 
Another element uh, in this strategy is the asset data. That, that's the one at the bottom, the asset data and risk data. So incomplete data on public sector assets uh, hinder e efficient decision making uh, related to both uh, financial and physical uh, management. Again, that is why we have under insurance problem uh, of government assets because of this uh, incomplete data on public sector assets. So government lacks access to complete data on all assets owned by national governments as well as uh, LGUs. Uh, as a solution uh, to that problem, the Bureau of Treasury uh, established the National Asset Registry System, so or the NARS, to provide a comprehensive inventory of non-financial assets of the government. Uh, the inventory initially gathered uh, by the BTR included uh, school buildings of the uh, DEPED, uh, roads and bridges of the DPWH. Uh, note that the asset data registry needs to be scaled up to cover all uh, government entities, not, uh, not as, as I was mentioning, uh, what is covered at the moment are DEPED assets as well as DPWH assets. That is why the National Indemnity Insurance Program for National Government, as I was mentioning uh, earlier on, uh, have yet to be Launch because of the uh, uh, issue of uh, the need to scale up uh, to cover all the government uh, entities uh, in the registry. Okay, uh, so uh, so overall, the national D DRF strategy, however, still lacks legal support. So there's no law, uh, no legislation existing at the moment to operationalize this uh, strategy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, just to add more dimension to the discussion of the disadvantages of having to rely uh, heavily on exposed uh, disaster risk financing. So one uh, one uh, issue is uh, well, two key issues actually are worth mentioning in this regard. One is the uncertainty and inefficiency in the levels of the endrim fund and the inefficiency in uh, in the fund access as you can see in the in the table uh, the uh, the level the table shows the volatile trend of uh, endrim fund from 2018 to 2022 uh, also the level of unutilized budget for endrim fund remains problematic uh, as you can see the total unreleased appropriation for 2019 and 2020 was at 6.9 billion and 5.3 billion respectively. In fact, if I were to uh, mention uh, uh, mention uh, about the uh, Yolanda, I think in 2016, uh, of uh, 38.8 billion uh, Endrim fund was allocated in 2016, uh, 38 billion. Then in 2015, it went down to 15.7 billion which was 146 lower than the 26 uh, budget. Just to uh, highlight the volatility or variability of the budget allocation level for, uh, for Endrim fund. Uh, and the second one is the inefficient operation of the fund. Uh, 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 next slide, please. The second issue or drawback uh, is to expose DRF is the inefficiency in fund access. Uh, so, the efficient operation of the fund is hampered by the lengthy process of approval and release of funds to recipients, including LGUs, which can take uh, from months to years. Uh, this situation creates uh, impediments to the recovery and re reconstruction process. Uh, for instance, uh, lack of knowledge or clarity uh, in the documents required by the submitting entity the need for validation of the damage and evaluation of the submitted request, the need to review the NDRMC recommendation by the Office of the President uh, or the process of release of funds from the DBM can all exacerbate uh, the operations uh, of the NDRIM uh, fund. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so among the best practices on fiscal risk management, a a natural or national disaster trust fund is one good example. Uh, natural uh, disaster trust fund can be used to establish a, a fiscal buffer to cover the potential cost of a catastrophic event 
in a timely manner without uh, engendering long-term fiscal sustainability. So uh, the experience of Mexico uh, in the D DRFI management with its core structure, the Fund for Natural Disasters or what, what they call as FONDEN, uh, provides a good example of a balanced strategy that builds upon a risk layering approach, uh, different uh, ex-ante financial instruments that can be used in combination to cover different uh, risk layers based on the frequency, severity of the expected uh, events. So the key features of the fund then, uh, let me just cite a, a few of them. Uh, in terms of the fund allocation, uh, no less than 0.0% of the federal budget uh, is allocated to, to natural disasters to be managed by fund then. Uh, this is uh, through legislation. So that 0.4% of the federal budget uh, is around roughly about uh, 800, uh, 800 million US dollars. So uh, this guarantees, uh, th let me just highlight, this guarantees a preset level each year uh, because uh, it is through legislation, unlike funding levels of uh, the, uh, of the entering fund, uh, which suffers uh, variability. Uh, another uh, important feature of the structure is the resource are managed as a trust uh, in the national development bank uh, and can roll over year to year. So the annual budget allocations accrue to a trust, thus allowing the service to grow, to grow in, uh, in long term. Uh, in contrast to the Philippines, any unspent amounts uh, in the end dream fund at the end of the fiscal year reverts back to the general fund. And uh, another one is a uh, fund, fund then can pay through three windows uh, but the majority of funds is spent on reconstruction. Uh, in the current setup, in the end dream, in the end dream fund, priorities compete for funding. Uh, fund then allows for certainty that funding will be channeled to both prevention and reconstruction because uh, there are specific windows that is uh, specifically uh, dedicated to the release and transfer of funds to uh, for specific purposes, whether it be prevention or reconstruction. Uh, fund then finances 100% of the damage to public assets for federal assets and 50% of the damage to subnational assets. Uh, okay, so basically that's the feature of the uh, Fund and Resource Fund. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, assuming that we adopt such, uh, such a structure, uh, National Disaster Trust, Trust Fund structure here, uh, there are possible scenarios that need to be considered. Uh, one, of course, is where to source the fund. So there are a number of possible sources for funding for the trust fund. So in, in this case, uh, I've cited two budgetary instruments which are commonly used to build fiscal buffers to cover the cost of natural disasters. And these are the contingency reserves or the contingent fund and the natural disaster funds, in this case, the entering fund. So uh, the recent use of the president's contingent fund was uh, to help prevent the spread of the uh, African swine fever in the country. So proposed application for CF were also raised to prevent a COVID-19 uh, outbreak in the country. So, uh, and the adjusted appropriation for the contingent fund in 2021 was at 18.7 billion. So clearly the contingent fund constitute a small fraction of the total public expenditure and are limited relative to the cost associated with natural disasters. Uh, another source possible outsource, of course, is the entering fund, uh, the annual appropriation for entering fund, which can be converted as the funding source for the National Disaster Trust Fund. So uh, as I have cited, the levels of appropriation to the entering fund is relatively comparable with what was required or is being required uh, in the uh, fund uh, allocation uh, for Mexico. For example, from 2015 to 2018, the average share of entering fund to total national government spending was about 0.76%, or if net of debt service is around 0.86%. So, Basically, it's within the, the threshold uh, requirement for, uh, for uh, disaster trust funds uh, uh, requirement. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay. So another uh, element to consider, of course, is the size of uh, fiscal buffers. As I was saying earlier, international experience indicate, well, they indicate varied level of uh, contingency reserves appropriations in order to do, do, deal with fiscal risk associated with natural disasters. But in most cases, the size of fiscal buffers range from 0.03 to 2% uh, of total government spending. So more or less, if you uh, look at the uh, proposal earlier about the sources of uh, financing, uh, Endrim Fund and the Contingent Fund can more or less provide the necessary uh, fiscal space uh, to be able to operationalize such concept. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so other, just to uh, discuss uh, briefly some of the key features of the trust fund, uh, one is the budget and financial accounts. As you can see, the trust fund will be comprised of a number of accounts for specific applications such as reconstruction, transfers, etc. So the budget for reconstruction uh, provides uh, resources for rehabilitation, reconstruction of uninsured and un un uh, uninsured public assets. Uh, so uh, the second element is uh, co-sharing arrangement. So it's important to encourage uh, LGUs to take financial ownership of their exposure and help reduce uh, their disaster losses. So the contribution of local government uh, may differ by sector type uh, uh, of assets, uh, type of severity or, uh, of disaster, and budget constraints of the local uh, government. So in, in Mexico, uh, the fund then finances 50% uh, of the recovery, uh, reconstruction, uh, cost for eligible uninsured local assets for the first time, it is damaged by natural disaster and the remaining 50% is financed by the local government. And uh, lastly, the institutional structure, the proposed institutional structure should allow for integrated approach to the DRFI management, unlike today, which is a disjointed uh, approach. So, so many agencies, uh, providing uh, different uh, interventions. So uh, a specialized coordination unit should be able to keep track of all allocated funds and associated recovery and re reconstruction activities. It should manage the efforts between the central uh, and local government as well as the private sector. So this coordination unit may be within uh, the proposed uh, uh, DDR or the Department of Disaster Resilience or in the Department of uh, Finance. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just very briefly, uh, just would like to uh, uh, cite the uh, efforts we've done, the CPBRD, our office, uh, in coordination with the World Bank to come up with a proposed specific amendment to House Bill number 5889. So the identified proposed amendment mainly in Article uh, 14, which is uh, entitled Disaster Risk Transfer and Insurance of the Bill, uh, highlight the need for a coordinated and evidence-based efforts in managing uh, disaster risk financing and insurance based on global uh, good practices. And just to cite a very uh, uh, important features of this amendment is, of course, one is the consideration uh, to consider establishing a long-term disaster trust fund that can ensure more efficient management of uh, DRFI, as well as uh, the laying out of cost-sharing arrangement with respect to uh, DRFI mechanism and, and, and instruments, and uh, authority and discretion to be given to the Department of Disaster Re Resilience in coordination with uh, DBM uh, and uh, DOF to mandate lower levels of government, LGUs uh, specifically to ensure financial protection of their own assets uh, against various risks. So uh, finally, uh, in conclusion, uh, I just would like to uh, uh, mention uh, uh, just a few uh, important elements uh, when considering the proposal of a national disaster trust fund. So uh, it has its own benefits. However, this type of uh, funds uh, is that uh, they are kept outside the usual budget process and follow different uh, allocation rules. If the financial management and governance procedure of these funds are not carefully designed, natural disaster, uh, national disaster trust funds can undermine fiscal discipline 
and uh, transparency. So on that point, uh, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, PIDS and Surfi Network. And I look forward to more discussion uh, after this uh, uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila.